New tonight now, the U.S. government says it will shut down the Metropolitan Correctional Center in Lower Manhattan, where Jeffrey Epstein killed himself two years ago. The Federal Bureau of Prison says the federal jail will close... Not too long ago, El Chapo, the big cheese of the drug world, spilled some tea about this joint he used to call home. Apparently, it's not a tropical resort with five-star reviews. It's more like a torture chamber. And guess another high-profile name who also faced the music in this symphony of suffering. None other than Jeffrey Epstein. In this video, we will uncover the truth behind the MCC and Jeffrey Epstein's time in this prison system. Metropolitan Correctional Center it is no secret that Jeffrey Epstein was jailed in MCC before his death. This federal penitentiary, located in the heart of Lower Manhattan, has a long and notorious history of inhumane treatment that has remained hidden from the public eye for decades. There were even revelations made by Joaquin El Chapo Guzman about the MCC being a site of torture. In fact, high-profile figures like mob boss John Gotti have long complained about the conditions within these walls. Let's start by taking a trip back to 1991, when lawyers for John Gotti also also known as the Dapper Don, raised concerns about the inhumane conditions at the MCC. They requested a transfer for Gotti, citing the need for better treatment and living conditions. This was just the beginning of a long history of complaints that would follow. Jean Theoharis, a professor of political science at Brooklyn College, describes the conditions as a hidden gulag right in the heart of Lower Manhattan. If she were to describe these conditions to you, you would be forgiven for thinking it was Iraq. Ahmed Kalfan Ghailani, convicted for his involvement in the bombings of two American embassies in Africa in 1998, reportedly preferred being detained at the U.S. military base in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, over the MCC. This shocking revelation speaks volumes about the severity of the conditions faced by inmates at the MCC. Guantanamo Bay, a place associated with controversy and human rights concerns, was considered more pleasant and more relaxed compared to the MCC. The issues at the MCC extend beyond the inmates. A report by the chief leader, a New York City civil service newspaper, revealed that the facility is struggling with staff issues. Officers are forced to cover three or four double shifts a week due to understaffing. This not only puts a strain on the officers, but also exacerbates the already challenging conditions faced by the inmates. It's a situation that raises serious concerns about the ability of the MCC to provide a safe and humane environment for those within its walls. MCC was established in 1975 as a pre-trail detention center designed to hold individuals awaiting trial on charges in the Southern District of New York. From its inception, MCC was meant to be a temporary holding facility, but over the years, it has transformed into a grim and overcrowded prison. The conditions within MCC vary widely, depending on where prisoners are held. The general population, the special housing unit, and the infamous 10 South Wing each have their own unique set of challenges and horrors. The general population is where most prisoners are initially placed. Here, they face issues such as inadequate temperature regulation, substandard medical care, and a constant struggle for personal space in the overcrowded cells. But it is in the SHU and 10 South where the true horrors of MCC come to light. The SHU is reserved for individuals deemed unsafe in the general population or those who have allegedly broken jail rules. Solitary confinement is the norm here, with prisoners spending the majority of their time alone in their cells. However, it is the notorious 10 South Wing that has garnered the most attention and condemnation. Over the past two decades, this section has primarily housed people facing terrorism charges along with high profile criminals. The conditions in 10 South are beyond comprehension. No outdoor recreation is allowed for prisoners in 10 South, and the windows are frosted, cutting them off from natural air and light. The lack of ventilation, combined with the filth and vermin infestation, creates an environment that is nothing short of a living nightmare. The lack of natural light further compounds the psychological impact of the MCC's conditions. Days turn into weeks, and weeks into months, without a glimpse of sunlight. This deprivation not only disrupts the inmates circadian rhythms, but also robs them of the basic human need for exposure to natural light. Studies have shown that sunlight plays a crucial role in regulating mood and promoting mental well-being. Without it, the inmates are left in a perpetual state of darkness, both physically and metaphorically. The absurd rules imposed on the inmates at the MCC further strip away their sense of autonomy and dignity. Not being allowed to see newspapers unless they are 30 days old is a deliberate attempt to keep them disconnected from the outside world. This isolation and 
and lack of access to current information contribute to a sense of powerlessness and further erode their mental well-being. The secrecy surrounding the conditions at the MCC, where lawyers can be punished for describing the experiences of their clients, creates an atmosphere of fear and intimidation. Inmates are left feeling voiceless and trapped within a system that seems designed to break their spirit. The impact of these inhumane conditions is not limited to the inmates themselves. Families and loved ones also suffer as they witness their loved ones deteriorate mentally and physically. The emotional toll of seeing a family member endure such harsh treatment is immeasurable. The MCC becomes a source of anguish and despair for those on the outside who are left feeling helpless and unable to provide the support and care their loved ones desperately need. Prisoners in 10 South spend the majority of their time alone in their cells, with even basic human interaction severely limited. They shower in their cells and are electronically surveilled at all times, leaving them with no privacy or respite from the constant watchful eyes. The isolation and lack of human contact take a toll on the mental health of those held in 10 South. Lawyers and advocates have reported that their clients' mental health deteriorates rapidly, making it difficult for them to make rational decisions in relation to their trials. To make matters worse, prisoners in 10 South are subjected to special administrative measures imposed by the Attorney General. These measures severely restrict their communication with the outside world, leaving them isolated and cut off from any support system they may have. The combination of these factors creates an environment that is not only dehumanizing, but also a breeding ground for despair and hopelessness. It is no wonder that rates of suicide in MCC are alarmingly high. The shocking reality is that the horrors of MCC have existed for decades, hidden in plain sight. Journalists, activists, and concerned citizens have long tried to bring attention to the inhumane conditions within these walls, but their pleas fell on deaf ears. It is no secret that the Department of Justice, including former United States Attorney General William Barr, was well aware of the conditions at MCC. Yet, they chose to turn a blind eye, allowing the inhumane treatment of prisoners to continue unchecked. The scandal surrounding Jeffrey Epstein's death brought the spotlight to MCC, forcing Barr to call for an investigation into the serious irregularities. But let's not be fooled by this sudden show of concern. The irregularities were not a surprise to the government. They were a well-known fact. The truth is that MCC has been structured on these irregularities for years. U.S. Attorney Jeffrey Berman, Barr's predecessor, Preet Bharara, and the judges of the Southern District of New York were all aware of the deplorable conditions within MCC. The federal prison system itself is riddled with such issues. So why did they choose to countenance these conditions? Why did they allow the abuse and corruption to persist? The answer lies in the government's incessant claims of necessity and national security. By invoking the need for national security, the government has managed to justify the inhumane treatment of prisoners at MCC. They have convinced judges and the public that these conditions are necessary to protect society from alleged criminals. But let's not forget that the people held at MCC are still awaiting trial. They are presumed innocent under the law, and their punishment should not begin until after conviction. Yet, they are subjected to filth, vermin, and isolation, all in the name of national security. The government's claims of necessity and national security are nothing more than a smokescreen designed to hide the truth about the systemic failures within MCC. They have created a culture of impunity where those responsible for the well-being of prisoners face no consequences for their actions. The lack of accountability extends beyond MCC itself. Major news organizations have also failed to press the issue, choosing to focus on sensational stories about high-profile criminals rather than the conditions within the jail. Perhaps it is the paradox of a high-rise dungeon in Manhattan's financial district that makes it difficult for people to believe the horrors that exist within MCC. The descriptions of the dirty, decrepit, and vermin-infested jail seem too far-fetched to be true. But the truth is, the horrors of MCC are well documented. Journalist Aviva Stahl's expose shed light on the filth, overflowing sewage, substandard medical care, wrenching isolation, and often indifferent and cruel staff within MCC. Lawyers, prisoners, scholars, and human rights organizations have all contributed to the mounting evidence of the abusive and corrupt conditions at MCC. Administrative remedies, legal motions, and research have all been filed to document the problems faced by prisoners. Yet, despite this overwhelming evidence, the public and the government have chosen to look away. There is a tendency to ignore the suffering of incarcerated individuals, particularly those who are publicly revealed. These prison conditions make Jeffrey Epstein's death controversial. Death Conspiracies
Jeffrey Epstein died on August 10, 2019, while waiting for trial. People have different ideas about how he died. Was it suicide, murder, or something mysterious? Let's look at the theories and puzzling details. The official explanation is that he committed suicide by hanging in his jail cell at the Metropolitan Correctional Center in New York City. But many people don't believe this and question the official version. Many people are puzzled about how Jeffrey Epstein, who was supposed to be closely watched to prevent self-harm, could have taken his own life while awaiting trial. Suicide Watch is a safety measure for those at risk, involving constant supervision and extra security. Epstein's ability to harm himself under this watch raises serious concerns about the prison system's effectiveness. The situation becomes even more suspicious when we learn that the guards responsible for watching Epstein were reportedly asleep and didn't follow the required checks on his cell. This negligence is troubling and has led to speculation about the possibility of foul play. Guards are accused of faking log entries to make it seem like they were regularly checking on the situation when they actually were weren't. This intentional deception raises serious questions about the official story and fuels the growing belief that there might be more to Epstein's death than what we're being told. The autopsy results have also made people skeptical about how Epstein died. Dr. Michael Barden, a well-known forensic pathologist hired by Epstein's brother to investigate, presents compelling evidence that the injuries Epstein had don't match what you'd expect from a typical hanging suicide. Dr. Barden, with his extensive experience, noticed something unusual about Epstein's injuries. Normally, in cases of hanging, a small bone in the neck, called the hyoid bone, breaks. But in Epstein's case, not only was the hyoid bone broken, but other neck bones were too. This is uncommon and suggests a different cause of death. Dr. Baden pointed out that Epstein's injuries look more like those in cases of strangulation, where external pressure on the neck can cause broken bones and other signs of trauma. These findings suggest a concerning possibility. Epstein might have been murdered instead of taking his own life. One idea is that Jeffrey Epstein did didn't die by himself, but had help in ending his own life, possibly because he couldn't handle the consequences of his crimes and faced a long prison sentence. This theory makes us wonder who might have assisted him and why. There are also strange conspiracy theories involving the Clinton family, suggesting they somehow played a part in Epstein's death. Some believe that the Clintons planned Epstein's demise to protect their reputation and stop damaging information from being revealed. Some people believe that Epstein had damaging evidence against the Clintons, suggesting they were involved in his illegal activities. This theory proposes that Epstein's death was a deliberate plan to keep him quiet and shield the Clintons from potential legal trouble. Epstein's situation gets more interesting because his cellmate when he died was Nicholas Tartaglione, a big guy who used to be a cop and was accused of murder. It's strange because they seem like an unlikely pair. Some people think Tartaglione might have had a role in Epstein's death, maybe as a helper or to keep him quiet. Now, think about Epstein's private island in the Caribbean called Little St. James Island. He's said to have done illegal stuff with under age girls there. The island is mysterious, with talk of secret tunnels and hidden rooms. There's a mysterious blue-striped building in a lush area that catches attention. It looks like a temple, with a golden dome, sparking many theories. Some think it's a music room for a pianist, while others believe it hides an elevator leading to a secret underground spot. To unravel the mystery, a contractor who worked there shared insights. He doubted the elevator theory, but noticed something odd about the temple's entrance. Instead of a lock inside to keep people out, there's a massive lock bar on the outside, making it seem like it's meant to lock people inside. Why did Epstein go to such lengths to secure it, possibly trapping people inside? These questions make the island and its owner even more intriguing. The temple symbolizes hidden secrets waiting to be discovered within its walls. Epstein was known for liking treasure hunting. He generously rewarded his staff if they found something valuable on the island, offering anywhere from a few dollars to a thousand dollars based on the item's importance. His employees became enthusiastic treasure hunters, exploring every corner and finding old items like rum bottles and plates left behind by previous inhabitants. These artifacts from the past fascinated Epstein. Why did Epstein love treasure hunting? Some think it was a way for him to escape from his criminal life, a temporary break to enjoy a more innocent activity. Others say he saw himself as a modern pirate, trying to get wealth and power through illegal ways. No matter why he did it, his interest in treasure hunting added more mystery to the island's story. It portrayed Epstein as someone eager for adventure and wanting to uncover the secrets of the past. Some folks believe Epstein might have used these secret places to run away and fake his own death. They wonder if he might have faked his death by replacing his body with someone else's. Epstein had the resources to pull off such a plan. There are even claims of seeing him alive after his supposed death, like footage from a drone showing a person resembling him on his private island. Though these sightings aren't proven, they contribute to the conspiracy theories about what really happened to Epstein. Some people think that Jeffrey Epstein might have had connections 
connections to Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency. They believe he could have been working as a spy, using his friendships and power to collect secrets about important people. This idea proposes that Epstein's death might have been faked to keep those connections safe and let him carry on with his undercover work. His crimes. In the annals of true crime, few cases have captured the public's attention quite like that of Jeffrey Epstein. The story begins with a man who appears to be a wealthy financier rubbing shoulders with the elite and powerful. But behind the facade of wealth and influence lurked a dark secret that would eventually be exposed. It all started in the early 2000s when allegations of sexual misconduct against Epstein began to surface. The first whispers of his heinous crimes reached the ears of law enforcement agencies and the investigation into his activities began. The FBI, in particular, took a keen interest in unraveling the truth behind the man who seemed to have a web of powerful connections. As the investigation progressed, a disturbing pattern emerged. Epstein was accused of luring underage girls to his luxurious properties, promising them money, fame, and a better life. But instead of fulfilling these promises, he subjected them to unspeakable acts of sexual abuse and exploitation. The victims, vulnerable and impressionable, were trapped in a web of manipulation and fear. The evidence against Epstein was mounting, and it became clear that this was not an isolated incident. The scope of his crimes was vast, with victims coming forward from all walks of life. From aspiring models to struggling students, Epstein preyed on the vulnerable, using his wealth and power to silence them. In 2005, the initial criminal case against Epstein took shape. The Palm Beach Police Department launched a thorough investigation into the allegations, uncovering a network of victims who had been subjected to Epstein's depravity. The testimonies were harrowing, painting a picture of a man who had no regard for the innocence and well-being of others. But as the case gained momentum, Epstein's legal team fought tooth and nail to protect their client. They employed every tactic in the book, challenging the credibility of the victims and exploiting legal loopholes. Epstein, with his vast resources, seemed untouchable. However, the determination of law enforcement and the bravery of the victims could not be silenced. In 2008, the case took a dramatic turn when Epstein struck a controversial non-prosecution agreement with federal prosecutors. This agreement, which would later come under intense scrutiny allowed Epstein to plead guilty to lesser charges and avoid federal prosecution. The non-prosecution agreement was a blow to the victims and a stain on the justice system. It seemed as though Epstein had managed to evade the consequences of his actions once again. Despite the non-prosecution agreement, the public outcry and the determination of the victims continued to grow. The case against Epstein became a symbol of the injustices that can occur when power and privilege are allowed to prevail. The survivors, fueled by their desire for justice, refused to be silenced. In 2019, the case took a dramatic turn when federal prosecutors in New York brought new charges against Epstein. This time, there would be no plea deal, no escape from the consequences of his actions. The evidence against him was overwhelming, and the survivors were ready to face their abuser in court. As the trial unfolded, the world watched with bated breath. The courtroom became a battleground, where the survivors bravely recounted their experiences and confronted Epstein face to face. Their testimonies were powerful, painting a vivid picture of the trauma they had endured and the lasting impact it had on their lives. The prosecution presented a mountain of evidence meticulously gathered over years of investigation. Flight logs, witness statements, and financial records all pointed to a man who had built a vast network of exploitation and abuse. The true extent of Epstein's crimes was finally being laid bare for all to see. In July 2019, the jury delivered their verdict, guilty on charges of sex trafficking of minors. It was a moment of triumph for the survivors, a validation of their courage and resilience. Epstein, once thought untouchable, was now facing the consequences of his actions. But before justice could be fully served, tragedy struck. Just weeks after his conviction, Epstein was found dead in his jail cell. The circumstances surrounding his death remain shrouded in controversy and speculation. Some believe it was suicide, while others suspect foul play. Regardless of the cause, Epstein's death left many unanswered questions and a sense of unfinished justice. While Epstein may have escaped a lengthy prison sentence, his death did not erase the impact of his crimes. The survivors, emboldened by their victory in court, continue to fight for justice and to shed light on the larger network of individuals who enabled Epstein's activities. In the aftermath of Epstein's death, the focus shifted to his associates and enablers. Ghislaine Maxwell, a close confidant of Epstein, was arrested and charged with multiple offenses, including conspiracy to entice minors to engage in illegal sexual activities. One of the most high-profile civil cases was filed in January 2020 by a woman referred 
referred to as Jane Doe. In her lawsuit, she alleged that Epstein and his associate Ghislaine Maxwell had recruited and sexually abused her when she was just a 13-year-old music student back in 1994. According to the suit, the abuse continued for a horrifying four-year period, with Maxwell playing a key role in her recruitment and participating in the assaults. The lawsuit sought justice for the victim and aimed to hold both Epstein and Maxwell accountable for their actions, but Jane Doe was not alone in seeking justice. In August 2020, nine more Jane Doe's came forward, filing a joint lawsuit against Epstein's estate. Among the alleged victims were an 11-year-old and a 13-year-old, their stories highlighting the shocking extent of Epstein's depravity. Additionally, one victim claimed abuse as far back as 1975, revealing the long-standing nature of Epstein's criminal activities. Another Jane Doe, in August 2020, filed a separate lawsuit against Epstein, accusing him of sexually abusing her for over a year, starting when she was 18. In March 2021, a civil suit was filed against Epstein's estate by a woman from Broward County, Florida. She came forward, accusing Epstein and Maxwell of trafficking her and repeatedly raping her in 2008. Her lawsuit sought not only justice for herself, but also accountability for the individuals who had facilitated and participated in her abuse. The civil cases against Epstein and his associates have brought to light the extent of his criminal activities. They have provided a platform for survivors to share their stories, seek justice, and hold those responsible accountable. These cases have also exposed the larger network of individuals who enabled Epstein's actions, raising questions about the collaboration of the powerful and influential. In addition to the civil cases, the US government took action against entities connected to Epstein. In 2022, JP Morgan Chase Bank was sued by the government, alleging that the bank had facilitated and concealed Epstein's human trafficking network. There's a serious claim against Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan Chase. The allegation is that Dimon might have known about Epstein's illegal activities and might have helped him through the bank. This information came up during a legal case in the Virgin Islands, where JP Morgan was accused of assisting Epstein's illegal activities for more than 10 years. In a hearing, it was mentioned that emails suggesting money transfers from Epstein were waiting for Daimon's approval. These emails are important because of their timing. They were sent in August 2008, just a few months after Epstein admitted guilt in Florida for illegal activities involving a minor. This was Epstein's first legal trouble, leading to him being labeled a sex offender. The concern is that Jamie Dimon, who was supposedly checking Epstein's account around this time, might have known about Epstein's crimes, raising questions about what Dimon knew and if he was involved. Now Dimon is under more scrutiny because the government of the Virgin Islands is investigating him. They have the authority to look into what he knew and when. This investigation is happening at a crucial time for JP Morgan. The bank recently accused one of its former executives, Jess Staley, of any wrongdoing related to Epstein in a legal filing. Staley, who later became the CEO of Barclays, resigned because of his connections to Epstein. During the hearing, the Virgin Islands lawyer questioned why only Staley was blamed and not Diamond, the CEO. This suggests that top-level bank officials, including Diamond, might have known about Epstein's activities. J.P. Morgan denied Diamond's involvement, stating he didn't deal with Epstein's accounts during that time. However, a federal judge disagreed, allowing the government to investigate Diamond further. This indicates that the allegations against Against Diamond might have some merit, despite the bank's denial. Although the current case against JP Morgan and Diamond is a civil matter, it's essential to remember that criminal charges sometimes arise from information revealed in civil lawsuits. The Epstein case began with investigative journalism and civil suits before leading to criminal charges. We'll have to wait and see if a similar pattern emerges in this situation. In the wake of Epstein's crimes, there has been a heightened awareness of the vulnerabilities that allow such exploitation to occur. Efforts are being made to strengthen laws, improve victim support services, and increase education and awareness surrounding the signs of abuse. The media has played a crucial role in exposing Epstein's crimes and keeping the public informed. Journalists and documentary filmmakers have worked tirelessly to uncover the truth, amplifying the voices of the survivors and shedding light on the systemic failures that allowed Epstein to operate with impunity for so long. If you enjoyed this video, click on the card showing on your screen right now for more videos.